No. Um, let's see here. We've got some things I want. I need your help on, and and I have them in my hand right here. There are two kinds of flyers out on the foyer table as you go out today. One is about Vacation Bible School, which is coming up very quickly upon us. Okay, and the other one is for September. The second Sunday of September is actually Central's 71st anniversary, or 72nd anniversary, I'm sorry. 72nd anniversary, and we're going to combine it with 9-11 that day, because it is actually on 9-11. And there's flyers out there to invite Policemen, firemen, EMTs, 9-11 operators, if people you know about, help us get the word out about that. It doesn't hurt to start even now in that. Um, and I think that's about it. Amy highlighted our usher ministry, and we greatly appreciate our ushers and all of what they do. And then uh, we have, they, uh, let's see, I think the uh, July visitations are the 19th and 26th and then August the 2nd. And these three Tuesdays right in a row will help us get better prepared inviting people to Vacation Bible School. On the Sunday before Bible School starts, the preacher that is doing the Bible School, Chase Williams, will be doing all the services that day. He is an illusionist, does the magician type stuff, and he'll be doing things uh, with us in the auditorium here on that Sunday. Uh, Brother Chase Williams and his wife and family. Okay, I think that's about it. All right, camp this week. Going, pray for the camp. They're getting ready to start their third week of camp. And uh, Carrie will be here in a little bit. He's been preaching over at Fordham Baptist this morning. They had an earlier service, so maybe he'll get here to tell us a little more about that. If not, I'll share with you what's going on. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and get started this morning. I'm going to do this whole walking back and forth thing, but I hope you guys get blessed from what we're going to sing as a choir. Uh, the song is Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. <clears throat> as the sun rose that morning on the day of Job's trial, he rose up to serve God as any other day. Bound and determined to live in God's favor, and nothing would stand in his way. But then the messengers came one by one with their stories. In just a few moments, Job lost all he had. Great wealth and riches and the health of his body, even his children were dead. Then his wife came before him to voice her opinion. She ju ju just cursed God and died. Job rose from the ashes and looked toward the heaven. He brushed back the tears in his eyes.
y'all would stand up with me, and we're going to open up our songbooks, get our meet and greet choir chorus going on. It is number 13, and that is, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. Now, everyone knows this song, right? <clears throat> everyone knows that you're supposed to be here to worship, right? Amen. Hopefully, that's what's going to be going on in your heart. That's what God's looking on when we sing. Let's turn to number 13. We'll sing that first verse. We'll go and shake some hands, and we'll come back and sing that last verse, okay? Here we go. Verse number one. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be gathered all around.
I'm doing good. <laughs> All right, everyone, let's come back to your seats. I hope you didn't lose your spot. If you did, it's number 13. And let's go to number 13 and let's sing that last verse together before we continue our service. Number 13 on Brethren, we have met to worship. Verse number four. Here we go with your songbooks. Ready? Let's sing. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. Then he'll call us home to heaven, at his table we'll sit down. Christ will good himself and serve us with sweet manna all around. I may mean, be seated. And again, good morning. Welcome to those watching from back home and you guys here today. Happy 4th of July to you. Take your bulletin. We've already gone over most of the announcements. I'll tell you what, Daniel. Why don't you come and tell us what's going to take place tonight? Okay? All right. So, you know, as Baptists, we like to eat, right? Amen. Who, who likes to eat? Hey, Amen. Y'all didn't raise your hands, y'all liars. Just so you know, you eat every day. Okay? But we're having a lot of fun tonight. Okay, tonight is our second summer family fun night. There's going to be a message on the family that we're going to have tonight, uh, but we have a snack for y'all. We um, recruited a bunch of people to get a bunch of watermelon. If you didn't know, they're on sale at Kroger. It's a plug for Kroger for about $2.49 or so a watermelon. So it's a pretty good deal. You get five of them for that price. Um, hard to find this time of year, but we have plenty of watermelon in the back, and we're going to cut up a whole bunch of it so y'all can eat as our summer snack. We also have some uh, watermelon games for the kids to play for the little older kids. We have a watermelon uh, blowing up contest. And no, it's not like Gallagher with a hammer. No, it's not with dynamite or anything. We're blowing it up with rubber bands. And if you've ever seen a watermelon get blown up with rubber bands before, it's pretty exciting. Uh, but it's kind of like a relay race. We're only reserving this for those that are uh, 10 and up. Like they have to be a big 10, all right? No one under 10 uh, for that as well. Plus, we have a watermelon eating contest. All that's going to happen after the service tonight, after the message. And if you want to take part in the watermelon eating contest, there's a sign up. Please put your name on there so we know how much watermelon to cut up for you if you want to eat watermelon. As much as you can eat in about three minutes. So just like we did last time, and it's going to be fun. If you like watermelon, that might be up your alley in, uh, in going for it. But the most important thing is we're gathering together as a family, and we're hearing what the Word, got, what the word of God says about the family. And it's really important because the family is the foundation for this nation. Family is the foundation for all of humanity, really. The family is the first thing God created. So why not come and hear tonight how God says your family should be put in order, okay? And it's my family, too. I'm preaching myself as well. So make sure you all come back tonight at 6, okay? Amen. And we're doing sparklers, too, for the kids, is it? Uh, no, that's Did we get sparklers? We didn't get sparklers. I'm not coming. No sparklers and no preacher. Right now. It should be an exciting time tonight. Come on out and we'll have a good time as a church family, as Daniel said. Look at your uh, Bible verse. It's a new one there in the uh, bulletin. <coughs> the July verse. It's 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let's say the reference first and then the verse and the reference again out loud. Okay? 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. That sounds great. Amen. God does love a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Okay. All right, Daniel, I think you got the Pledge of Allegiance, right? Yes, sir. All righty. So, it's 4th of July tomorrow. Independence Day, as it's more uh, apt to be known. And uh, so in honor of that, I'd ask all of you, invite all of you all to stand up with me and face our flag, and we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, 
under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All righty. I don't have a number for that song. Huh? 678? Okay. Amy's going to play the national anthem for us, so if y'all remain standing, she might even sing it too. <laughs> okay. And uh, 678, if y'all want to join in and sing it as well, you're welcome to, okay? <clears throat> oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rocket's red glare The bombs bursting in air Gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Let's sing that second verse, if you would. Please sing it with me, the second verse. Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand Between their loved homes and the war's desolation Blessed with victory and peace May the hand rescued land Praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation then conquer we must when our cause it is just and this be our motto in god is our trust and the star-spangled banner triumph shall wave the land of the free and the home of the brave. Amen. All right, so let's go ahead and I'll sit down and um, I guess we can have the offering going right now. Don't lose your songbooks because I'll have one more song after this. All righty, who's going to pray this morning? Mr. Jared, go ahead. Dear precious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for such a blessed and beautiful day that we can come and share together as a family, Lord, and celebrate our independence. Uh, Lord, but we also get to celebrate our independence one other time, and that's when we look to you, accept you as our Lord and Savior, ask for forgiveness for our sins, and we have independence from the old sinful nature and the old sinful body that we once had. Lord, we thank you for that opportunity where we are just forever in your debt. And Lord, as we as we work so hard and we work to better our lives around us with the things that you give us, Lord, let us give back a portion of that to you so we can continue to strengthen your kingdom. And it's for all these things we pray in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
All right. The reason why I had y'all sing that second verse of the Star Spangled Banner was uh, not only is because it was part of the song, so it's important that you know the whole song. But I know a I knew a pastor in Kentucky that he had a testimony about the Star Spangled Banner, and this was a retired Army helicopter pilot, and he was a warrant officer. He was a Black Hawk pilot. Did that for 20 years before he retired from the Army and became a pastor. Well, while he was going through grade school, in the school that he was going through, they made them sing the Star Spangled Banner every day, first and second verse of the song. And while he's going through Warren Officer Candidate School, who's ever heard of that school before? Warren Officer Candidate School, it's more like mentally challenging than regular basic training, and it's so much attention to detail. And when he was going through, they had demerits. And if you made 10 demerits, so any kind of deficiency, you were ejected from the school. You, you got washed out. Well, he had so many demerits. He had like six demerits at the time, and they had a wall locker inspection. And all his stuff was spaced out, you know, two inches on the hangers. The T-shirts were rolled six inches. The underwear was rolled four inches. The socks had the smiley face little roll in them. Everything was spaced just in the ice, okay? The inspector came and opened up one of his jackets saw a dry cleaning sticker in there. You know those little paper tags? And um, I could be wrong about the total number of demerits, but he had three demerits left. And the inspector looked and said, okay, there's one piece of paper, that's one demerit, and two staples, that's two, do two more demerits. And you're done. And he was dumbfounded, like one little, small little detail that he missed, and now he's about to be ejected, and he said, unless you can sing the second verse of the Star Spangled Banner. And he was a big old dude. He, he could sing like Pastor Charles. He's super loud. And um, <laughs> good voice, too. So <laughs> when I say big, I'm like singing chest. That's what it was. The point where he was doing choir practice with his church, and his choir kept on telling him to sing softer so they could hear themselves sing. But he just let it rip. He said, all right, sing the second verse of the Star Spangled Banner, and he let it rip. And he's in one bay, and it's a room about this big, and the commandant was over down the hall, and he came in, and, like, tears were actually coming down his face. It was weird. Because he was commenting on how beautiful that sounded when he was singing. And he gave him a pass. And they ended up winning and graduating the school. So it's important to know the whole song. <laughs> Don't leave your tag on the laundry either. So. <laughs> well, that was an awesome story. He's, a, uh, he's still pastoring, so that's good. Um, if you ever go to Kentucky, look him up. His name is Ken Shaver. 679, next song we're going to sing. I'll stand with me, number 679. We will sing... The first, second, and third verse of this, number 679, and then we'll have a special after this. Number 679, Battle Hymn of the Republic, first, second, and last. <clears throat> Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea, with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free, while God is marching on. Glory. 
glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Sing the third verse? Okay. No, I'm just God never moves without purpose or plan when trying his servant and molding a man. Give thanks to the Lord, though his testing seems long. In darkness he giveth a song. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried, and purified, I shall come forth as gold. I could not see through the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I bowed to the will of the Master that day. Then peace came and tears fled away. Now I can see testing comes from above. God strengthens his children and purges in love. My Father knows best, and I trust in his care. Through purging more fruit I will bear. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes. He knoweth the path of, end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, brother. All right. Um, we have a special. No, I mean, we just had the special. Young people, you are dismissed to go to junior church. <laughs> Woo! I'm confused because my wife said to announce to let the junior church go right after the choir special this morning. They have a special speaker back there today, uh, Drew Hickson, and uh, he's going to be speaking to them. So I know they're excited about that, okay? Revelation chapter 1 in the Word of God this morning. You know, I, I have preached on July 4th type of messages, patriotic messages, um, throughout my lifetime in the ministry. But I felt led to go a little different route this morning. Last Sunday morning, I uh, spoke about the swing low, sweet chariot, the rapture of the church being taken up when we come to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. And that's a wonderful time. I'm looking forward to it and hoping you are too. 
Revelation chapter number one. Let me get over there with you. And when Jesus comes again, and let me time, I'm going to do like Jonathan. I'm How about now? Yep. yep. It's, it's a problem. It's the loose nut on the steering wheel is a problem. That's me. Revelation chapter number one. Um, and I started thinking, you know, we're citizens of this country here in the United States of America, and we thank God for the privilege to be here and to be born in this country. Um, but also, if, as a believer, you are a citizen of a heavenly country. Abraham looked for that country, and we are too. And now that we know that the Lord could come back at any moment, that should keep us excited and ready and wanting to be like Him and not be ashamed at His coming, but look forward to His coming. And then I started thinking, it doesn't end there. Now we know that after that Christ comes again, we meet Him in the air. But the second coming technically, technically is in two phases. One of the beginning of where the rapture takes place, as we dealt with last week. And those who are in the ground who know Christ, and those of us who are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, but then there's a time up in heaven for seven years where we will go through what is known as the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to be a tremendous marriage ceremony, if you please. And that marriage supper that will take place in Christ the bridegroom, Marries his bride, his church. And then also will be a, quite an austere judgment that will take place for believers at the judgment seat of Christ. For we know that we must all appear, Paul writing to Christians in that passage in 2 Corinthians 5, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He talked about it being an austere judgment, a terrible judgment. And I think there's going to be a lot of eye-openers that day as we... That's why I think also the Bible says in Revelation near the end of the book, he will wipe away all tears from their eyes. But I also know that uh, during that time, there are a lot of judgments that will take a place upon this earth. It's known as the day of the Lord in the Old Testament. It's known as the great tribulation. Uh, there are the vile, excuse me, the, the um, seal judgments the bowl judgments and the trumpet judgments. I think it's seal, trumpet, and bowls. That goes seven, seven, and seven. That God will pour out His wrath upon this earth. Now God has been very patient for 6,000 years. But He will judge sin. And the more we see as sin runs rampant, yes, even in America and around the globe, we know that God will not allow sin to pass by. There will be a judgment that will take place. Um, and then at the end of that seven-year period, Jesus rallies us. We get together. On, he is on the white charger. Faithful and true is what it says on there. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords, you know. And we on white horses are come in white linen and raiment. And we ride with him as he comes back in the clouds. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, when those disciples saw Jesus after he rose from the dead, he'd walked upon this earth for 40 days and 40 nights. The Bible says, as those angels told the disciples, as they're watching Jesus go up into heaven from the Mount of Olives as he ascended, they said, this same Jesus, I love that phrase, this same Jesus that you see gone up into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. So that same Jesus is going to come back again and a sword will come out of his mouth and he defeats his enemies. But he will come and his feet will touch there on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives will split in two. The glory, it is the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. It is an amazing thing to think about that day. And we're going to be with him. And you have a part in that, you know. So what I would like to do is preach about this kingdom coming. The fact that Jesus is coming again. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. 
What's different between the second coming of Jesus Christ and the rapture is, not in the rapture, not every eye will see him. And he will take us up. I mentioned last week about how he takes us to a secluded place in the sky. And then we are his and we go on up to glory for that seven year time. But every eye shall see him. Can you imagine how that's going to take place? With all the digital things that we have today, no doubt that will be so. But I kind of think it will be even without the digital things. They'll be able to see. And they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, John says, amen. amen. Let it be. That's right. Even so, let it be. Yes, even in the wailing that will take place when Jesus comes again. Those who rejected him, those who sided with the enemy, they will weep and they will wail. It is a personal coming. This same Jesus shall come again. It's not a spiritual coming, some ghost coming in the sky. It is not the coming of the Holy Ghost, because he's already come. Uh, he will be, of course, taken up to glory in the rapture. It's this same Jesus that will come. It's a sudden coming. Malachi tells us, watch, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Mark tells us about that. His come will be, coming will be as quick as lightning. Ma uh, Matthew 24 tells us that. It's a visible coming. He said, every eye shall see him. Uh, Matthew 26 says, hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man. What a sight it's going to be for those who have rejected and loved the things of this world more than they love the things of the next. When Jesus comes again, it's a visible coming. It's a glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. When he came the first time, he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant, the Bible says. But now, he's not going to be the man of sorrows. He's going to be known as the great, when he appears the second time, will be in great power and glory that will take place. I'd like to see the great power and glory that takes place when Jesus comes again. And then glory to God, us, we his saints are going to come back with him, as we said. The Bible says in the book of Jude, verse 14, Behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his saints. You going to be in that crowd? If you're saved, you will be. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And by that time we will be made like him. We shall see him as he is. What a glorious thing. We're going to be prepared for all of this in heaven. And he's going to establish righteousness upon this earth for his thousand year reign. The Bible says he will convince the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds and all these things that, he, that they have done against him. He will convict them of it. He will judge with righteousness and, and with, excuse me, he will judge... With righteousness, he shall judge the world and the people with equity or fairness. He's a righteous judge, but he will judge sin. And that's in Psalm 98, 9. Psalm 72, 7. In his days shall there be righteousness, and it shall flourish an abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. His reign will be that of peace, because why? You say, people, you say preacher, there'll be people on this earth that will still reject him, there are people who will still fight against him, yes. But the scripture says he shall rule with a rod of iron. Right. <clears throat> King of kings. Lord of lords. King Jesus ruling with a rod of iron. And there will be peace for the first time truly upon this earth. Will he appear before or after the millennium? Don't answer out loud, just think with me. Does he come before or after the millennium? Well, I believe he comes before the millennium. Because as you read the scriptures in the, in the prophets, you find there are many scriptures that give us uh, as he is going to be fighting against the nations when he comes. Zechariah 14, verses 3 and 4. He, the people will be in gross darkness when he comes because of sin. And he is the Lord that will arise in glory, the scriptures tells us. Uh, there's no millennium when he's coming. It comes because he's coming. He is the millennium. When Jesus comes again. What does the New Testament tell us? Many times in the scriptures it talks about how the Lord will judge 
uh, when he comes. When the Lord of the vineyard comes, does he not find righteousness prevailing on the earth? Is there righteousness? He's going to find a time where people are still sinning against God. And the Bible says he will miserably destroy those wicked men. So he will judge the earth. He will judge the nations. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. The world was at its worst in the days of Noah. The world didn't believe the preaching of Noah. Only eight souls were saved and the rest of the world perished. They had 120 years to repent. And they still rejected it. Will there be Christ deniers and Christ rejecters when Jesus comes again? Yes. There can't be any millennium on the earth and then Jesus come. It must be that Jesus comes first. And then the millennium. When the Son of Man cometh, nevertheless when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith? On the earth? Will he find any faith on the earth? Before the Son of Man comes with that power and great glory, the Bible says men's hearts will be failing them for fear because of the things which are coming on the earth. Luke 21, 25. So there are a lot of things that are going to be taking place that tell us that Jesus is going to come before at the beginning and start his millennium, not come afterwards. What do the Spirit say? The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Paul said that in 1 Timothy 4. Isn't that happening in our day? There are people who name the name of Jesus Christ and you can't get them to stay faithful to God if you try to, to chain them in church. And yet he's known as faithful and true. We need to be found faithful and true. Is not the sign. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first. And we know that. People will be scoffers and be mocking. Ah, oh, Jesus, you talk about this Jesus coming. You've been talking about it for a couple thousand years. He hadn't come yet. The scoffers will have their say. But the Lord of glory will have the last say. And Jesus will come and bring peace. Because he will rule with a rod of iron. The scriptures tell us that. We don't fully understand what's taking place, but we know that our God is right and he will be ruling justly. Some of the results when he comes. When Jesus comes and we come with him, what are some of the results? He's going to manifest his own people. And Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Is it going to be wonderful, King Jesus? who is the bridegroom, and we are the bride, and we're on the white horses, he's on the white horses, and we come with him in glory, don't you think that'll cheer his heart? We are the redeemed of the Lord. I'm talking about any person born again. You're redeemed, you've been purchased with the precious blood of the Lamb. That same Lamb, that same King of kings and Lord of lords, that same faithful and true will ride on that white horse as the nail prince will still be in his hands. Then the prince of the crown of thorns will still be in his skull. It'll still be in the prince of the nail, I mean, excuse me, the, the spear in his side and the prince in his feet. He's still King of kings and he'll be known as this Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And he will lead us and his people and we will go back with him. All I got to do is sit on that white horse and smile. Amen. The Bible says that sword just comes out of his mouth. Sword of the word of God. Amen. And destroys his enemies. You say, that sounds kind of rough. Well, just think, again, 6,000 years have gone by. If, we're not, if we don't accept what Jesus did on the cross for us, then God does have to judge. The Bible says that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, 1 John 3. And he will take vengeance on those who know not God. The Bible says, I tell you, turn there with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Preacher, what's going to take place when Jesus comes again? Well, let's take a look at it. I said, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. The Lord Jesus is going to be revealed. Look at verse number 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. The Thessalonians, if you read the book of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, Paul deals a lot with the coming of the Lord. 
Some of these folks had loved ones who had died already, and they were worried, well, is Jesus going to come back for them? What's going to take place and all these things, you know? And so Paul comforts these people. He said, to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Not only us, but the mighty angels will be with him. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power, when He shall come to be glorified in His saints. Why is He doing all this? Because as we ride with Him, as the mighty angels are with Him, and vengeance is taken in flaming fire, He will get glory through all of this. Hallelujah! He deserves all glory. That's right. Amen. Yeah. He took all the shame upon the cross of Calvary. He took all the wickedness, things that we've ever thought and done. And it was placed upon him for our sakes. He deserves all glory Amen. and praise. Worthy, uh, it says, wherefore also we pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. Why should we as believers live a life of a godly lifestyle and doing zealous of good works? Because it glorifies him. Amen. And you Thessalonians, and I say to us Christians today, don't be worried. God has our future all in control. The king has already planned it all out. The mighty angels will come with him, with us. He will restore his ancient people, the Jews. That's another wonderful thing about the fact Jesus is coming again. Zechariah 12, verse 10. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn. Here he comes. He's getting ready to split the Mount of Olives. Every eye sees him, including every eye of his own people, the chosen people of Israel. And the Bible says they shall mourn because they rejected him. They did not receive him as Messiah. The Bible says, but in that day there shall be a mountain, excuse me, a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. God, Jesus Christ, will forgive His chosen people. The Scripture tells us. And then He's going to judge the nations, the Bible says. It's clearly taught in Matthew 25. It says that He will definitely judge the nations that are there. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Where is he coming out of, out of Zion? Where's Zion? Jerusalem. Israel. He splits the mountain. The deliverers come. The Jews then will believe. In whom they pierced was the Messiah. Glorious days are ahead for all of us, if you know the Lord. The Bible says in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, that is a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. What does that mean? That stone, the great stone, the Lord Jesus Christ will come. And he will dash his enemies to pieces. He will destroy them. The Bible says, And the stone uh, that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The whole earth shall see him. That's where we get that from. Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He will judge the nations. And he will destroy the Antichrist. Amen. Right. Amen. I mean, say glory when your enemy is going to be defeated. Right. 
The Antichrist is the, is the opposite of Jesus Christ? And he's going to destroy him? Glory to God. Then shall that wicked be revealed, the Bible says. Yes, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glorious days are coming. You want to know what's happening? Here it is right here before us. When Jesus comes, and he comes in that second coming, we come with him. Glorious days are ahead for us. I'll be able to see the Antichrist. You'll be able to see him, I know. But he will be destroyed. Hallelujah to that. Glory to God. And then he will rule the nations. In his days, the Bible says, the righteous shall flourish. He shall have dominion from sea to sea. All kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. Psalm 72. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Zechariah 14, 9. War shall cease and peace shall be on the earth when he comes whose right is to reign. What would you put on the sign out there recently, Ray? Help me here. The one you just did before this last one. The Father reigns and the Son shines or something like that. Christ the Son shines and by the Father reigns, right? Something like that. Either way, he's in control. Glory to God. The Bible talks about the whole creation groans until that day comes. Romans 8, 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. War shall cease. Anybody who tries to raise their hand against King Jesus will be put down. And the king shall reign in the throne in Jerusalem. Just as it was prophesied in his first coming. As the angel prophesied to Mary. That he would rule and reign. And then he's going to reward those who have become faithful. In our Sunday school class this morning, this past week in studying this, I had forgotten. You know, I mentioned last week about one day that the Lord will reward us with the crowns, right? At his feet. And we will take those crowns and do what with those crowns? We will cast them at his feet, right? But the rewards don't stop there. I know that's at the judgment seat of Christ. But the rewards don't stop there. If you study the other, the other stories and the other truths that Jesus Christ taught in the Gospels, you will find again and again that we will rule and we will be with Him. It talks about how, well, let me just, it talks in like Luke 19, the guy with the, the different pounds, that the different, Eng, Eng, we call English pounds or whatever, that were given to the ten different servants, and what those servants did. And did they invest the money? Did they come back with a return on their investment? And the Lord saying, those who, the guy who took his pound and went and hid it, what did he say? He says, take the pound from him and give it to the one who has ten pounds. We will be rewarded. It talks about that. His servants are rewarded according to their works at his coming. Yes, it's talking about 2 Corinthians 5.10. But it's also talking about 1 Corinthians 15. And it talks about how that we will be rewarded. I started thinking about that. When you read the scriptures, it talks about how one day, when he comes to reign upon this earth, that we are not only heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, but the Bible says we are also kings and priests of the Lord. All right, look up here at me. Here's Father John, Priest John. There's Priest Daniel. There's Priest, Ms. Priestess, Miss Hall. You are a priest of the Lord. That's what the scripture says. Yes, it does. I no longer need any man to go between me and God and, and be the one who gets forgiveness from me. The Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So I need no one to go between me and the Father. The Bible says you are a priest of God. Why? Because when Christ died, the Holy of Holies was opened up. The veil of the temple was rent in twain. There was no more need for a high priest to go into the temple because he had offered himself 
the altar as the as our high priest, the ultimate sacrifice of himself, and put that blood and applied it to that, that altar there in the heavens in the glories. Hallelujah! I no longer have to wait for someone to pray for me. I'm glad that people do. But they cannot absolve my sins. The only one that can absolve my sin is he who shed his blood for my sin. The Lamb of God. Christ Jesus. But I'm also a king. Here you go, look up here at me. King John. In that day I'll have hair. In that day I won't have a tummy either. In that day I will, I'll be all right. King John on the throne. I don't think we're just rewarded with crowns at the altar before the Lord. I think we're rewarded for things when we come back down to this earth. Because the Bible teaches that some will rule over more cities than other cities. I've asked God for Yorktown. <laughs> no, I think I'll take Richmond. Grant took Richmond, I'm going to take it back. <laughs> or maybe Washington, D.C. All right, now. Oh, but that's all right, Ms. Angie. I'm going to turn. You talk about cleaning out the swamp. I'm going to clean it out. I'll drain the swamp. Uh, you saying this? Uh, you're saying that, uh, that women can have abortions? Well, my King Jesus from Jerusalem... Jesus, what are you saying about that? Thou shalt not kill. Uh, thou shalt not kill. Take him out. Do away with him. Uh, what, what, what is this? Uh, Some about LGBTQZ, XYZ, and all that stuff. King Jesus, have you ever heard of LGBTQ? You, you haven't heard about any of that? Okay. All right. And, but, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it is sinful. Yes, you did hear. Okay, it's sinful. Okay, uh, LGBTQ, off with all the other letters. Amen. You know why we don't hear the amens as much? Because most of us are ingrained with what comes across the television set and our phones and computers. And that's what's happened to our children in America, in, the, in our schools, and in our universities. That they have swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. That this is of God. Or at least, if there is a God. Now we try to prove these sins and say they're of the Lord. Well, one thing about it all. I'm not going to worry about it in the coming of the Lord. Because he's going to take care of all of that. And blessed be God, and you will. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 41. As we will be raised, as one star differeth from another star in glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. There are some large stars and some small stars. Some beautiful ones and maybe some not as beautiful. We will be different. We will all be beautiful, I know, in the eyes of the Lord. But ladies and gentlemen, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you and I will have to answer to His command. And we will gladly do so. And we will rule and reign with Him, the Bible says. Can I say that a second time? We will rule and reign with Him. I'd like to say that a third time. We will rule and reign with Him, the Scripture says. Hallelujah. Do you think it's worth it being saved? Amen. Amen. Ah, glory to God. I want to get into in detail next week the reign, the reigning of Jesus. Okay? Please stand with your heads bowed and eyes closed. If Jesus were to come today, and if you do you know that you'd go to be with him? Are you saved? Are you on your way to heaven? Do you know Christ as your personal Savior? Have you been forgiven of your sins? Do you have eternal life, the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you don't, trust Him today. With heads bowed and eyes closed, as you all...
altar is open. You could come and seek the Lord today. Maybe there's some things, Christian, that if Jesus came, you'd be ashamed before His coming. Come, make it right at the altar today. Maybe there's some loved ones that you'd like to pray more. If you've kind of fallen down on the side about praying for their salvation, I guarantee you, Miss Sandy, if you're watching this morning, I know you're praying for your family. And I know that Ms. Ar Arlene did, Miss Katie did, and many of others in this room are praying for their loved ones and family to be saved. Because Jesus could come today. And then, when we do our going before Him at the judgment seat, we will, yes, rule and reign with Him. But according to our works, as our, our zeal, are we zealous of good works? Are we serving the Lord with all we've got here now because of what He's already done for us at the cross? Are you serving the King of kings and Lord of lords now? And that will ultimately determine how much you will rule and reign with Him in that millennial reign, that kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. After that, Jesus will finally conquer Satan and we will be with him in glory forever and ever. What a wonderful, wonderful promise. Promise says from his word. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Jesus could come today. Amen. Let it be so, Lord. Let's live a life that honors Him and pleases Him. Let's do everything we can to get people to go to heaven with us. This is the only time you've got, the time that you have here on this earth, to serve the King. And one day we'll be rewarded. Say, well, I just want to go to heaven. I just, I don't care if I don't get to do anything down here. For the Lord, I just, we just, I just can't wait. I'll just... Come sit on a pew and soak and sour. Well, that's not what Jesus taught. Because you will be rewarded for your good works. What will King Jesus, what will the judge, he will be the judge on that throne. How will he judge you on that day? And then when you come back with him, will you come back ruling and reigning many cities, many places? Or will you have the, the very rewards that you were going to get taken away from you and given to others? It does make a difference. It does mean something. Well, I just get to go to heaven. Well, that's not all there is to it. You will be greatly ashamed before Him and before all, the, all of the heaven. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It talks about in that judgment seat. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I didn't mean to preach on the judgment seat of Christ, but that is what's coming next after we go to heaven. But I am looking forward to when Jesus comes again. You can look up this way. Amen. Glory to God. And God's people said amen. Amen. King Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Amen. Brother Al, would you close us in prayer today? Before you go, before you go, I would like you to pray for Jeff Collins. Jeff went through major surgery, hernia surgery, six hours. Um, he is back home. He is resting, so pray for him. Ernest White is now back home. Pray for Brother Ernest. Uh, no more MRSA, no more pneumonia. Uh, call him the rebound kid. He keeps coming back. I want you to pray for Brother Johnny, Brother Johnny Curran, and, and Carolyn. Uh, Johnny has gotten some news, possibly negative. We're going to hear some more, know more about it soon. Uh, and we're praying, you know, the Lord is with, you, with Johnny, and he knows that. And our, God's people are with you and rallying with you. We love you very much. We don't know just yet. Some, some things, we're going to hear more about it. Uh, so keep him in prayer, if you would. Uh, I don't want to miss anybody. Uh, keep, if you would, pray for, pray for um, Bob and Vanessa Leach. 
in the passing of Rachel, the missionaries that we support with the Rock of Ages Prison Ministry, and um, pray for them, if you would, during this time. I know this is a hard time. Their daughter, 44 years of age, dying of breast cancer, um, and she already had cerebral palsy all her life. Uh, so just, just pray for Bob and Vanessa during this time, too, okay? All right. Come on back to Family Fun Night. Let's see who can spit a watermelon seed about 12 feet or longer, right? Okay. okay. Come on back. Six o'clock. Choir practice, five o'clock. Mm -hmm.